Hi guys, today's episode is going to be on a different subject, but I would say the most important subject we have covered so far. We're going to have Jay Baker, our school record holder, talk to us about being a black woman in this society growing up until now. And it literally broke my heart to listen to some of the stories she had, experiences of discrimination just because of the color of her skin. And Jay is truly my hero and anybody who experiences discrimination on a daily basis in their lives is just something I will never understand. But what I can do, I can be part of the solution, right? I can educate myself, I can protest, I can raise my voice anytime I see discrimination and I can educate my friends and my family or anybody who doesn't understand racial biases and issues uh, black people have in this country. And I hope all of us can do these things daily so in the future we don't have to go through these issues all over again and we can put this down once and for all. So please listen to Jay Baker. So we got Jay Baker. Jay, thank you very much for coming. Um, I know we are living in some crazy times, uh, but also these crazy times are not just the last couple of days. Uh, it's something that has been going on for, for centuries. Um, and I think people are now able to see more because of videos, uh, people having phones. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, not anything about sports, right? Uh, even though you're, you're our school record holder, you're one of the best athletes we ever had uh, in in at UVA, uh, but uh, I want to take this opportunity and, and uh, talk about something else. And uh, I think people need to hear uh, as much as we can we can uh, uh, give it to them from experiences, people firsthand like yourself. Um, talk to us. How was uh, your experience of being a black woman uh, through childhood and college and, and high school, elementary school? How was it? Being growing up and being that your dad is a coach who uh, moved a lot, a lot uh, from place to place, how was that? Yeah, so for those that don't know, my dad has been an NFL coach, um, dabbled in college a little bit, but has primarily been an NFL coach my entire life. So throughout that, I moved to o- over 10 states. Um, I went to three or four elementary schools, two middle schools, three high schools, Um, So I've moved around a lot and every state has definitely been a different experience, but they all have kind of had the underlying themes when it comes to race, Um, race and race theory that I never, I very seldom, sometimes I did, it felt outright hate, but often almost on a daily basis, I felt what was called microaggressions. And this started at a very, very young age. I remember, um, the first time, so just to give people context also, just being in that tax bracket, when you get up to the NFL, that means I was pretty much raised in full white societies. Um, I was the only black member of my high school class, uh, high school graduating class. I went through countless grades um, in private schools where I was the only black member in the school. Um, It wasn't until, I went to some public schools and obviously there's gonna be a little more diversity there, but even, Uh, When you look at the segregation of neighborhoods, even those public schools, you're going to have very, very few black students in those certain areas. And so that's something that I feel like a lot of people don't realize how many black students kind of feel feel alone growing up. And I feel like the first time I ever realized just because I was so used, I went home where my whole family was black and then I went to school where everybody's white and I didn't really notice a difference until somebody pointed out to me, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was kindergarten. And a little girl said to me when I was looking to play with her and her friends, she said, no, you can't. And I was like, I was confused. And I was like, why? And she was like, because you're darker than us. And I was really confused one because she was, she was darker than her friends too. This was, this actually happened to be an Asian Mm -hmm. student um, who was darker than her friends too. But whiter whiter than me and so i guess that was kind of a gatekeeping method even as children that people don't realize and i had kind of very similar experiences all throughout elementary school and a lot of times it would be just one kid would make a joke about me being darker or brown or the color of feces um i actually heard a lot growing up um wow and it was never like kids that i i never registered as a kid like oh they're hating me Um, or they're being racist just because I kind of didn't understand what those terms meant. I just remember I was always being othered, even by my friends, my, the people who I loved and the people who I know loved me, they still always othered me. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's something a lot of kids don't real, a lot of people don't realize that their kids are doing, that they're instilling in their kids. Um, 
because that's really where nobody's born. Nobody's yeah. born yeah. with hatred. You're you're raised in an environment where it's okay, and you're raised in a biased environment, and that's where you get your biases from. Yeah. So just to talk about, I guess, a couple few microaggressions um, is the term, thankfully, that has come to light. Um, in the seventh grade, well, this is actually what I would consider a macroaggression. Uh -huh. uh, but in the seventh grade, I was walking with um, a couple of friends in a mall and the mall was in uptown Charlotte where I lived back then or downtown Charlotte where I lived back then. Um, so there was many black people in the mall just because the area was a very diverse area. And I remember walking and um, one of them, we were passing black people and one of them said, God, I hate black people. And I turned really confused because they were walking next to yeah. me and they were like, not you, of course, not you, but black people in general. Um, and so I remember at the moment I didn't, I was just like, whoa, that was jarring, but I, I didn't stand up for myself. I didn't stand up for black people just because I was like, okay, well, they love me. And so I think I kind of um, was able to other myself in my head from black people. And I think that's kind of something that um, I experienced and so many other black people in my position experience our whole lives is the strive to be the extraordinary black. And that's something yeah. that was created by um, a white supremacist system. The idea that if we can earn, if we can earn their respect, then we get to be the black person who's their equal. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the idea that like, I have, I went to the University of Virginia. That's an incredible school. I go uh, to law school now at Georgetown. That's an incredible school. Um, it's like by all means, I've earned the title of extraordinary. And it's the first thing I know that if, God forbid, something were to ever happen to me, I know it's the first thing people would say is, look what a future she was going to have. Um, look how accomplished she is. She was a Division One athlete, all of that. And it's kind of something that we now have to train ourselves out of, mm. is the idea that we have to earn our worth. Because the fact of the matter is, people, people who aren't of color yep. were worthy of life the minute they were born. So the idea that we have to break stereotypes that were never ours, that were just placed on us, and the idea that we have to earn our way out of um, earn our way out of the lower class is just something that I'm really happy has come to light recently, mm -hmm. because it's really really important. And I just like to give more attention to a couple of microaggressions that you'll hear really often um, that I heard my entire life: "Is you're so pretty for a black girl?" The idea that um, Black girls are, uh, black women are on a second tier of beauty that if you were to compare me to white women, of course, I could never, could never compete with them. But now that I'm only in my class of women, I'm at the top of it. And I think that's re one really disgusting. I think so many girls um, who look like me were, so we were trained to say thank you to that. I don't, I can't think of a single time in high school where I ever challenge that I was just like well thank you and I actually did feel complimented by it because once again when you're told every day that black people are lazy black people are ugly that um, black people are poor you're like well I don't want to be like them I, I want to be the, the black person that white people like mm. um, so I think it's really important that we kind of uh, train ourselves out of that and I think it's really important that we train ourselves out of it in sports as well um, going, like I said, being on all white teams, um, my entire life, I was always the freak of nature, um, the beast, the, the, just the person who was born so much more athletic than everybody else that they were, they were hard workers and they were smart and they had athletic IQ and everything that I had was genetic and everything that they had was because they were a gym rat. Like you didn't work so, for it. Exactly. And it's like, I mean, you coached me. I, I like to think you were I, not a hammer thrower. You're not a full hammer thrower. That's for sure. Yeah. So just kind of um, coaches training ourselves out of it because I never, none of my white coaches, those are some of the dearest people in my life ever. Like I never think any of them were being racist towards me. I think, like I said, it's that implicit bias um, that we are just everything athletic I ever achieved was due to my race and everything academic I ever achieved was in spite of my race. Mm. Um, I had kids growing up who, when I was the fastest one would always say, well, it's because you're black. Wow. Um, I was the most accomplished person in my uh, most accomplished athlete in my high school statistically by far. Um, and it was always, well, it's because she's black. 
So just kind of training ourselves out of those because they're not overtly racist. They're not, I don't think these people wake up that day and want to put me down for my color. It's just, that's your belief system. And you re we reinforce it through television. We reinforce it through parents. Um, we reinforce it by people not calling out each other. Um, so now we've deemed it's okay. And so I think it's just really important that we try to hold ourselves accountable. Sorry if that was a really long answer. No, 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 no that's definitely uh, not, not too long. We can, this is, this has been going on for, like we talked about before this uh, interview, this has been ha happening for centuries. This is not something new. I think the only reason now we're hearing more because people have more uh, cameras, uh, the, the cell phones that can, that can uh, record these, these murders uh, that that can be preventable, like uh, George Floyd, uh, Ahmad, uh, and, and we talked about Brianna and and so many others before them. That the, this keeps happening, and I think uh, it, it definitely, if there was, uh, I w I will never understand uh, as a white man, even though I'm a foreigner in this country, right? I can I can be the other, but I will never understand how it is to be black, born and living in the U.S. in a country that you built that you help build, that, that it is what it is, the greatest country in the world, because of the slavery. And then you have this systematic uh, in, racism and injustices and failures to, to uh, protect these people, all people, right? Uh, especially these most vulnerable that you use for so, so many centuries. It is it's unbelievable. I, 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 and I told this to my wife, my wife and I, we have different experiences. Uh, like I said, even though I'm, I'm a foreigner, I'm a refugee, she's she's a, a black woman from New York, lived in Atlanta. Uh, she sees things that I don't see. I'm blind to it because I walk when I when I walk down the street and you talk about this uh, microaggression by right? micro. Not even like you said, they don't wake up and like, hey, I want to ruin somebody's day, somebody's a black person's day by saying that you're pretty for a black girl. Right. They don't think about that. But that's. There's such a, like you say, in, in, in a root in, in the society and these um, communications with parents o over generations, right? Uh, this is, is just has to stop. And this is, uh, this, there's, uh, there's such a long road to go. Uh, we came, we came far, but there's so much, so much to go. Yeah. And yeah. I think that um, so by now, so many people have seen the video of the woman, Amy Cooper, racially profiling the man in Central Park who is a birder. Um, that man, like kind of how I was talking about the extraordinary black idea by all means fits that profile. Yeah. And there's no amount of degree in education that can save you from your skin. He was instantly yeah. called, the woman weaponized the words African-American. She said she was gonna call the police. She knew exactly mm -hmm. what she was doing. Yep. And that speaks a lot to the police system in our country that our race can be weaponized by them mm -hmm. that's not that just shows um in desperate need we are of reform not only on the person by person basis but on the systemic basis mm. oh the it, it, it's it's i'm i'm without words i saw that video and like you said she she exactly knew what she was doing and i'm i'm gonna call cops and i'm gonna say african-american man is trying my life right so she knows to use that uh, those two words, right? So, so to get attention, and which is another example how they, what, what kind of society we live in, and how we have to change those things. Um, and uh, it, it's just, it's just, uh, it's demoralizing to see. However, there, there is a hope when you see so many people protest. Like I said, that we're in ten day now. This is ten day of protests uh, uh, going on. Um, what uh, we have. Uh, quite a few questions uh, that, that people wanted to ask uh, and uh, most of them are how how can what, what can we do uh, to help uh, but before that that we're gonna leave that to, for the end before that, I want to ask you as a uh, as a black student athlete uh, what what are some experiences that you had from from high school to the university have were things different or and what things you wish you saw more of or that that were better when you were in university of uh, virginia yeah so um as i think as a black woman um in i just for people who don't know my two main sports growing up were actually equally track and soccer mm -hmm. um soccer in the united states for women is a predominantly white sport um due to the expense of it if you want to get to a high level 
you're going to usually have to be on a travel team um, in addition to your high school team. So you have, it's just a lot, a lot goes into it that um, systematically erases a lot of POC from that. So in high school, in high school, I feel like I experienced more of it in soccer than I actually did in track. Um, in high school, I remember finding out another team had nicknamed me the Nigerian Nightmare, um, which is kind of funny. I laugh about it, but I'm not Nigerian. So yeah. and, um, <laughs> I'm not Nigerian. They had no way of knowing um, what country I originally hail from in Africa. I'm the descendant of a slave, the descendant of many slaves. The yeah. highest percentage of any African country I have is about 26%. So I'm kind of um, as much of a mix as you can get um, in terms of being African American. So it's kind of just the idea that the idea all the time that once again, things were always tied to me, my blackness, never my skill. Um, so it's, obviously it's a comp, it's a compliment to some degree that you would go out of your way to make a nickname for me. Um, but it's disappointing that it happened to be a racially based one. Um, I think in track, I once again, in high school faced a lot of the problems that um, I was racing against predominantly white athletes. And so the only reason I was beating them is the only difference they can see. They don't see how hard I worked in high school. They don't see the amount of hours I spent. They don't see that I won states in four different events yeah. in one year. They don't see all of that. Um, they don't see all of the hard work or diversity I put in. They just see that they lost and they're white and I won and I'm black. So the reason I won is because I'm black. Um, Transitioning into college, I actually had more of a hopeful experience than some people might think. And I, I do think that's generally due to the nature of my sport. I am lucky enough to be in a sport that has hailed or black athletes have championed for decades now, um, especially in America. Uh, for those that don't know, I was recruited as a sprinter. Um, so I came in definitely there, definitely in a predominantly black field. Um, so I don't think I experienced um, those same microaggressions I experience every day. And that's just because every person I trained with every day was black. So we all kind of were living the same experience. Um, I went to the University of Virginia, which has a different relationship with race. So I think as a black student athlete and just as a black student in general, um, my junior year was when everything kind of clicked for me that um, once again, it was, it's just going to be a place that it deals with race in a tricky way. Um, mm -hmm. For those of them that don't know, I imagine most do know, we had a white supremacist rally called Unite the Right that ended up being fatal for um, one ally, Heather Heyer who was um, protesting the injustice of the white supremacists. It's actually kind of crazy to think about the fact that yeah. white supremacists were giving a place on grounds. And so that's kind of, um, as a black student athlete, something I had to grapple with and that I'm still hoping, I'm hoping the university grapples with in a much more direct way. And um, on the athlete side of it, the NCAA in general and the NCAA in general, they're the athletes are profited um, about most. You get March Madness. Yeah. Um, you have millions, millions of dollars, billions. Yeah, millions of dollars for March Madness. You have football, who um, also gets billion, billions of dollars throughout the season. You have um, their TV contract, mm -hmm. uh, the playoffs, all of those things raise so much money. And these are these stars are predominantly black athletes. Mm -hmm. So it's like we every day as black athletes are commodified and loved um, by people who without the jersey on don't care about us. And it's just, it's so sad. And I, I've been really, um, I've been really hopeful. I've seen Charles Snowden, who's a leader on the uh, UVA football team currently, him and many of his teammates have been protesting in DC every day because they are the ones who face commodification the worst as black men in, in society. Um, black men are, in, are targeted the second they're off the field and they're dangerous. These same men who are in Scott, who fill up Scott Stadium are cheered for every single day. When their helmets are off, these are the same person you will clutch their purse when they walk by. You clutch your purse when you walk by or won't sit next to you on the bus. And I think um, any 
a predominantly white university, black athletes are kind of going to feel that. We kind of, um, I think self-segregation ends up taking place to a degree as a method of protecting ourselves. And I think, um, though it's not, obviously it's not the best method to cope. I, I think it's a really prevalent one and I, I'm definitely guilty of it. I uh, immediately, when I got to Virginia, all of my friends were black. Mm -hmm. um, until I switched into throwing, which has a lot more white athletes. Mm -hmm. And that's when I actually kind of had white friends who were a part of my normal circle at UVA. So I think that every, um, every athlete should kind of look introspectively, like, am I, am I self-segregating and why? Because when I, when somebody finally asked me from high school, they were like, why are all your friends black now? You don't like white people anymore. And I never even noticed it because I, these are the people that were around me. These are the people I picked to be around me. And I was like, oh, I, I, I was wondering why I did pick those people. And I think it's a method of protection because it's people who I know were never going to judge me for the color of my skin. I was never going to have to get those one-off remarks. Um, and I was really hopeful once I did kind of move into the arena of throwing. Um, people have seen just from following UVA throws, or if you don't follow UVA throws, we're extremely, extremely close bunch. Um, it was, it's, I don't even know what our percentage actually of color would be. I've never thought about it. Now that I think about it. Um, I know there's me and Pobo and then Brittany joined. Um, yeah, yeah, about 30%, 30% yeah. of throwers, right? Yeah. And um, I feel like that's pretty representative of throwing in general. Luckily it is getting more diverse. Yeah. Uh, but that's something that I feel like was probably my most hopeful experience of college as a whole, not only in race relations, but kind of showed me. And I think a lot of that was due to so many non-Americans yeah, <laughs> being yeah. a part of our group, um, where you take uh, Hilmar and Talma, for example, who are in Iceland. Um, so probably are from the least black country possible. As white as you can get. Yeah, like possible. And these are like, and you even, and you have not say, and these are like the most loving people on earth. And it's like, I never ever felt uh, discrimination from them. So it's like, I don't know, we kind of as, as white Americans, we have to kind of ask why, why that experience yeah. is different. It, it, it does matter a lot what kind of perspective and what kind of community you grow up in. Uh, and, and, and that can set you, uh, set you for life. And like you said, those microaggressions, and I like that you pointed out um, how uh, it's it, being a student at a uh, predominantly white institution, right? Uh, when I went to uh, UC Berkeley, uh, in, uh, student newspapers, and there was a comedy section uh, at the end, always uh, talking about the cur current issues. And uh, one one day there was a, an article saying about uh, a protest that were being, uh, it was different, it was unrelated, uh, a racial issue, it was something else. But uh, the director or whoever wrote the article at the end said we were trying to get opinion of our black students as well, but both football players were out of town th th this weekend, right? So like, there's you know that there, this is the issue, right? You don't have enough students uh, of color of minorities at these universities, and it's it's a such a uh, it's it's a our a country is shooting their, it's shooting ourselves in the foot because we're not giving the same opportunities to people. And, and it has to be something done, right? So uh, so it's really unfair. Like my wife said, um, great example. She said, if you have a furniture right, that it stays on a carpet and you move it and you're going to see for days and days that carpet is going to stay the same, right? So imagine having all this burden of, 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 of slavery and segregation and Jim Crow laws uh, for centuries. How long before you, you, you have an equal opportunity, right? So the opportunity is not equal. When you see that, that we have, you know, almost 13% uh, of black people in the U.S. and you have five, six percent at most at the universities of uh, black people. That's something that we we have to we have. And to, it's like yeah. take that take that percentage. You take that percentage and then you ask yourselves what percentage of those are athletes. Yes. So not yeah. like because as as a country we have to surely we have to have a better way of breaking poverty and breaking the poverty gap than other than through athletics. Mm. Um, so I don't know what UVA's percentage would be. Maybe it would be like 2% or something. But that still leaves, if you eliminate the athletes, it's still only 3 to 4% black students. And I know me growing up, 
Um, my parents actually hated it because it ended up being right, but our neighbors would always ask like, oh, does your dad play football? Or kind of wondering like, how'd you get in here? Yeah. And unfortunately the answer was yes. Um, so it's like, we obviously don't like having to play into those stereotypes, but we should ask ourselves why we have a system, which, and you can view that by watching the NFL draft. The NFL draft this year was like the trauma Olympics. It's like, why do we have a system that black people literally have to put their lives on the line mm -hmm. just to get out of poverty, just to put a roof over their parents' mm -hmm. head? So it's like, there's just so many things to ask ourselves within the system of as celebrated as, as athletes should be, and as amazing it is that athletics is an avenue out of poverty for so, so, so mm -hmm. many black people, mm -hmm. we should ask ourselves why. We should ask ourselves why that's one of the only avenues that's one of the very few avenues because i mean my both of my parents um my father grew up comfortable and my um mother grew just grew up in new york uh in the 60s so you can imagine how that was um so you just ask yourself like how are we supposed to live in a post-racial society where my grandma went to a segregated school and she's still alive she's still alive i talk to her every day she calls me um, she's terrified of me protesting because she knows yeah. what, ha what has happened. And she has such an innate fear of the police and such an innate fear of, um, white people who have persecuted her, her, her whole life. She doesn't, she, there's so many people who cannot understand that we're in the idea of a post-racial society because their childhood trauma says otherwise, and yeah. they're still alive. These people are still alive. My dad grew up in Baltimore in the 60s. Like, in what world is that, is that a post-racial society? And these mm -hmm. people are only 50 years old. Ruby Bridges, who's famous for being the, um, the black student who went into the into first integrated school, she's 65. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and she's seeing all it's of this seen, come up yeah. again today. It's when you crazy. see when you see your leaders getting shot, peaceful readers being shot, what do you? How do you live with that? I I just I feel like you don't. The idea that peace, first of all, just as a law student, the fact that our First Amendment right to peacefully assembly and peacefully protest is under attack right now. It was under attack in the '60s. Should be very very alarming to people. Um, it scares me, no matter what you're protesting, um, no matter what your beliefs are, it is your right to do it peacefully. Uh, so the idea that that, the idea that any leader, um, the, the idea that any leader has the power to quelch that um, under American law just isn't true. So we should challenge that and you should, a lot of, I see a lot of people who are getting arrested uh, post curfew. So I would challenge people to ask, and a lot of the responses to that are, well, they shouldn't have been breaking the law. I challenge people to ask why they're okay with a law that was set up on a day-by-day -day basis that makes it illegal to be outside at 6.04 p.m. Mm -hmm. That's a direct limit on our First Amendment rights. Why are you okay with that? Yes. So that's kind mm -hmm. of um, something I think a lot about. I think a lot about how we people think we're in a post-racial society. You were talking about how your teammate got hit um, with the can in 2006, the last time I got called the N-word by a non-white person was 2016. So that's not, I mean, that's what, three or four years ago? That's, we're not, and people have faced that way. I have coworkers that, I have a coworker that call, got called the N-word when we were leaving work last summer. So just kind of a challenge for people that want to sweep it over the rug. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are saying, um, I usually don't speak up on issues that don't personally affect me, but, I think that race should affect everyone because it does affect everyone. And I encourage um, non-black people to spend the privilege they never earned. And that's something I really think that's important. It is so important. It's so important that, that to, to, uh, to, to, to be silent is being complicit and it really is. It really is because that's when you stand by injustice and those and, 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 and let it happen. Right. So, so, uh, you're condoning by your silence. You're condoning, and it's not fair, maybe, for some people to be in a situation. Uh, you don't have to put yourself in harm's way. Uh, but uh, like uh, President Obama just said, right? Go vote, right? That, that's a like, do something against the injustice that you see. That is obvious. It's so unfair to live in a society where you have to 
uh, be really resilient to those ignorant comments, right? And you have to be strong. And like you said, it's you have to uh, juggle mentally in, in your mind to stay calm and to stay sane in this society that is always from sides throwing these, these balls at you, right? That you are not worthy, right? Nobody's condoning violence and looting, all right? Uh, but you we should not be surprised that there is a protest uh, what else like if you if you kneel that's not okay right uh, on an anthem and then anthem and then the people are now talking more freely about it i'm so happy to see that now that people understand why copernic kneel it, it, it there was had nothing to do with veterans he had to do exactly what he was saying police brutality right and that's what you see now and how ironic it is that uh, poor George Floyd was murdered this way, right? This is exactly what's happening. But we as white people, we don't, we have to get into that even if most of us are not racist. We have to acknowledge that we have privileges and listen to our black brothers and sisters and, 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 and ask, okay, why? Right? It's it's not you are privileged and you're, you're thrown to be born any color, any any in any country, any religion. You're just it's a lottery. You were born in in this situation, this time, in this color, right? So nobody asked before they were born, like, hey, I want to be born in Iceland, right? Like nobody has that choice. You just are, and and we are all humans, and because of that, we have to have a responsibility to say something against uh, the injustices, even even when they're especially when they're not being uh, done to us. We cannot stay silent because because. And like you said, if you can employ a military on your own people, like what's next, right? So there has to be human rights to everybody the same. Um, and I would say even more for those people who were oppressed for so long. You worked so hard, Jade, and day to day you came at 7 in the morning, and I told you this so many times that your parents, you, you were an you incredible worker, that, that what you have done. And when you say like something like that happens when you work so hard and like, oh, she's, you know, she's of that color. That's, that's, yeah. it's not a big deal, right? Like whatever you do, it's not a big deal because or, you, know, you had the people find a way to the, 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 this, uh, uh, to take that accomplishment out of you, right? For your color. It's not like I'm the child of two, to, to combine my parents have five ACC championships. So to completely deny genetics in, um, terms of my success, it would be ignorant and I would never do that. Um, but just the idea that that's all it was, that's kind of um, what hurts more. And I think kind of what you were talking about with kneeling, uh, also just as a black person, just for people who do kind of have teetering thoughts on kneeling for the flag, um, when it, it's to me as a black person, it, it feels really disrespectful to my ancestors who fought uh who fought in wars um to all black people not just particularly me mm -hmm. but um the idea that black people don't have grandparents and great grandparents that also fought for yeah. freedoms that we don't get to enjoy um the idea that we place this i i love this country um so i'm not diminishing the flag by saying a piece of cloth but the idea that we do um place this this symbol um, above actual lives of actual Americans, it just it feels disrespectful. And so I get the idea that it feels disrespectful to the American flag to kneel during the anthem. But I feel some. I feel if you truly knew what was going on, it'd be disrespectful not to. Because the most patriotic thing you can do as a citizen is fix your country and want better for your country. Because we are. I, I truly believe this is one of the best countries in the world. It's a one of the powerhouses of the world but it doesn't mean it can't be better so yeah that's what i kind of think about kneeling no exactly it, it just it took a, and you can see players football players now going back and, and and saying like oh my god like i i understand now right what you were trying to do but it's it's uh it might be for some you know even even though if you feel that it's going to be a little too late to do that those such of things you know for some athletes you still have to do it uh, you still have to acknowledge the pain and the reasoning. You know, you just you just take a second and listen to, to the person why they're doing what they're doing. Spend the time, um, and uh, and you can you can hear this uh, a lot. You know, people are just uh, you know, but I have you know, I'm not racist. I have black uh, black friends, right? But if you do, then ask them. Hey, hey, why is this? Uh, I see 
I see most black people uh, uh, condone this kind of behavior. Why is that, right? Just take a second, and then they're going to tell you this is because of all these murders, because of all these brutalities, all these undocumented things that police have done uh, in recent years and centuries towards uh, us. This is why we, we want to change. We want to have, you know, and then, then when you hear them, when you hear, you take a second, then you can realize why, uh, why those things. Part of this awakening is realizing, and I, I hope everybody is realizing, just because you love a black person doesn't mean you love black people. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's something that I real have, I, I'm a black person and I realized that very, very recently when I thought about all of my experiences and all the experiences of my peers, um, that I'm like, a lot of people, a lot of my friends loved me as a friend. They didn't love me as a black person. So I think it's something that people need to stop excusing themselves with. Um, because you have that black best friend, you have that black boyfriend, that black girlfriend, you have to kind of look at yourself and wonder like, do I just love this person or do I love their people too? And I feel like that's really, really important. And I, I'm happy you said the kind the thing about it may seem too late, but we still have to do it. There's I've received so many people reaching out and so many um, rather apologies or calls for action or just kind of just checking in on me a lot of um, my non black friends and not one time did I think it was too late. I every single time somebody texted me, I thought I am so happy that this person realizes yeah. realizes that they've upheld this in the past and that they're not going to in the future. So just because you think, um, just even people who have more explicitly racist past and they know they do, don't think just because you have that past doesn't mean you can't change. Because the idea that we can't change with new information is something that has honestly been perpetuated a lot more by social media. But we're allowed, every human being is allowed to change with yeah. information and you're allowed to change with compassion. So don't be afraid to reach out and don't be afraid of saying the wrong thing. I know that's something that really keeps a lot of people from it. And I really do completely get it because so many people are so heavily scrutinized on social media um, for saying the wrong thing. But just you have to be willing to stumble into something, but you have to say something because silence back. Silence has always been violence. Yeah. I know right now we're kind of we're, we're now treating it more like it is, but mm. silence was violence for me when people on a bus full of kids heard me call the N-word and said nothing. Mm. I felt it not from the kid who said it, but I remember every single face who was sitting there and said nothing. Every single time I've um, what, had a racist act uh, done to me or done to my sisters, I remember not only the face of the person who did it, but the face of everybody who didn't say anything. So that trauma that I now carry and um, have grappled with and I'm fine, but it's, it's not just been by the perpetrators, by every single person who was silent. So silence was violent then, and it's even more violent now that we're on the brink of what I feel like is real, real change. I feel like this kind of um, between COVID, between people not having to physically clock into work mm. um, and these videos and the social media age, I kind of feel like this time, we kind of have like the perfect storm. We have the perfect storm of civil unrest, the perfect storm of peaceful protests, the perfect storm of people just being fed up. Um, and so I really do think this time is going to be as revolutionary as the 60s, um, as revolutionary as emancipation. So I just challenge you to, if you're wondering who you would have been during slavery, if you're wondering who you would have been during the civil rights movement, what you're doing now is exactly who you would have been. So I challenge you to be the person on the right side of history. So, so Jay, I, 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 it breaks my heart so bad to hear and, 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 and to, to, to hear these stories over and over again to people uh, happening. Uh, it's just through, through the childhood. A child should not go through trauma. No human should go through trauma of, of being ridiculed let alone something else, right? Especially in childhood to be called uh, names or to be microaggression of, of, of uh, attacked of with the microaggressions that just is it's, it's so heart, heartbreaking. Um, and I, I gotta, again, uh, and I say that so many times, you're an incredible person. You changed me, you changed your team. You were such a uh, unbelievable person, loving and hard worker, uh, inclusive of all your teammates. You had teammates, I can say from uh, from Europe, from Iceland, from uh, Slovenia, Croatia, 
uh, black, white, Jewish. Uh, you had all kind of uh, teammates, and uh, you you had a lens, and this is because your parents, uh, in part, instilled this in you that you to see the person truly how it is, and then to treat everybody, give everybody a chance right away, right? Not bec- not exclude them for the race. Uh, it's, it's just incredible, and I, the world needs more people like you. Um, and please do tell me. So now that we we uh, what. Uh, what can we do as coaches and your uh, not not black coaches and not black athletes what advice would you give uh, how they can help how we can how can we help and uh, to, to make this situation better yeah so um, the four main ways that I I believe strongly and I've been recommending to um, black people and especially non-black people because that's the primary of the people who have reached out asking how they can help um, first First and foremost, obviously, you can march. Um, I, w- I realize in a global pandemic that is not an option for everybody. I am by no means um, asking people to put their at- their health at risk if they if they don't feel safe. Um, it's just an option for people who do feel able, who do feel they have the means, and who do feel like that's their their most effective method. Um, so one, you can march. You can be active in the streets um, peacefully. Two, you can. Sorry, two, you can donate. Donating is probably the most understated, uh, the most understated way you can help. And I know so many people feel like, oh, my $10, um, it's hollow. I wish I could do more. That's doing a ton, especially like I said, we're in the middle of a pandemic that is disproportionately affecting black and brown people. You donating to these bail funds is huge because because pe- there are no way in these jails, especially at the mass they're arresting protesters, to maintain social distancing and to maintain safe environment within COVID. So you donating to these bail funds and getting people released out of the jail as soon yeah. as possible, that's huge. That's, ab- that's huge. It's so much bigger than people think. So I never want people to feel like, Just because they only gave $10, they're not doing enough. Give within your means. Give generously within your means. You're doing enough. Keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And and that uh, that one combined with the third method, which is education. And I think long-lasting, when all of this ends, because the protests, as much as I wish they wouldn't, because I'm I'm enjoying it, um, uh, I'm enjoying the movement, obviously not enjoying everything. But um, as much as I... I know the protests will end one day. Education is what's going to make change beyond this. And um, there are many books you can read. Uh, they're pretty much, any, you can Google at any point, like books to read as an ally, um, and you're going to get hundreds of books. Um, if you don't feel like you have the capacity um, to read a book right now, you can go on Netflix or documentaries. There's Documentary 13. Um, you can also watch When They See Us. They're both very, very hard to watch, but they're very important to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, they're both very educational. And I, I think that, once again, that's the thing that's going to outlast here. Um, because if you're able to take, if it's guilt, if it's motivation, if there's any emotion welling within you and you're willing to put it towards a long-lasting understanding of this system, that's what's going to give you the courage to continue standing up for this and noticing it. And um, it's going to give you the tools to navigate the fourth method, which is challenging conversations. And I I think that's the one that um, out of the people who I've encountered in my life, that's the one I want people to have the most of, um, because I I really want people to feel empowered to challenge themselves for how they've upheld um, white supremacy within their own lives. I really want people to be able to challenge their parents, because a lot of these people, like I said, it's a learned behavior. A lot of parents grew up learning that black people just learning the stereotypes about black people that learning in um inferiority learning laziness um learning that we're criminal or stupid um so i want you to challenge your parents and ask why why they feel a certain way or what they they're doing to fix that bias because so many of them have that bias and so many of them it's not their fault so if we're able to come from a compassionate side of humanity and not from attacking people we're really going to get far. And that's the same for challenging your grandparents. Um, some simple questions that I've been asking people is kind of what I said earlier. Um, there are so many times we hide behind the law and we're not willing to ask ourselves, is this law just? Yes. Because the Nat Turner rebellions, anytime the Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman broke the law every time she 
flee every time she fled slavery. Uh, fled slavery. Um, Rosa Parks broke the law by sitting in the front of the bus. There, like these, none of these time, none of these revolutionary times in our history have ever have ever been passed just by following blindly submissive to the law. We are the whole reason the Second Amendment exists, which. Um, many people choose not to believe mm. is to have people armed for and to rise as a militia against an unjust government. That is literally the reason it exists. I'm not a guns person. So I'm not saying use your second amendment rights in that way. Um, at all. I'm just saying that is the reason it exists. We're not, this country was never ever made to be stagnant. Um, Thomas Jefferson, who was the founder of the university of Virginia um, and all of his, aged ways that we have seen things we can follow Thomas Jefferson for and can't. One of the ways we can is that he did write the De Declaration of Independence. He was a brilliant writer. He was a brilliant thinker, despite um, despite some of the more controversial thoughts that I 100% condemn. He wanted the Constitution to be a living, breathing document mm -hmm. um, that we adjusted, that we always challenged, that we always, that advanced with society. So I just think that's something to always ask yourself, ask yourself how we're advancing society, how we're doing the forefathers proud in that sense, um, how we are kind of besmirthing them in other sense. Um, so those are kind of the four main ways, I think. And I honestly think they're all, um, obviously marching is a little more involved, but I still think it's extremely important. Um, it's how we've after Martin Luther King was assassinated, there were six nights of just complete unrest, um, causing $47 million worth of property damage in the United States. And on the sixth day, they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1968. So the idea that riots don't work, though maybe, though obviously looting and violence isn't what we want to see, but the idea that it doesn't work is not American. It's just simply not true. So, um, and luckily, as now, like you said, we're in the 10th day, as it's gone on, they've become increasingly uh, peaceful, they've become increasingly safe, we're seeing less and less escalation um, by the police, we're seeing less and less escalation by the protesters, so it is becoming more safe, but those are kind of, like I said, the four main ways. Uh, <laughs> I, I just want to cry. Uh, the, the, you're you're such a, an incredible and educated person, uh, the, the, despite all the hardship that you went through. And you were not uh, the fact that you know so much, and, and uh, not just because you're going to be a lawyer one day, uh, but as a young age that you are so uh, knowledgeable about so many things that you had to learn because you you the things were not thrown at your way. You did not have that ju star jump uh, like most of us do. Um, there's a great video that I always uh, um, uh, think about a coach uh, making a race for 100 bucks and, and then he's like okay if you've grown up with a single parent with, like you, you get all these all these uh, 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 stops in front of you right um, and I think it's so to go back to protest uh, it's so important to do that uh, if you forget that this country in uh, was a part of uh, British Empire right at yeah. some point you the had to tea party was a riot <laughs> Yes. So it's saying that you cannot protest is just insane to me. Now, yeah, nobody's condoning violence, especially to uh, in, in any situation, right? Uh, uh, especially throwing throwing stuff at and burning stuff. Uh, but you have to be heard. And uh, w there's laws. How many laws were there before, even the recently, that you had schools that had segregated problems, right? That's not something that, uh, that is, is way in the past. Uh, so yes, we do have to protest. The, the laws that are there uh, doesn't mean they're right, and they, they, we have to see how they affect everybody. And do are you being are you able to be a full human being with full opportunities like everybody else? Uh, so that's what we have to ask ourselves. Uh, yeah. uh, there's a video I saw by uh, Jane uh, uh, Elliot. Oh my gosh, she's amazing. <laughs> And <laughs> she has students, right? Like, if you want to be treated like black uh, people in this society are being treated, stand up, right? If you want to change, nobody stood up, right? So we know, we know wh how it is uh, in our society. We need, we need to change that. Yeah, and it is. I, I know so often. Just kind of a closing. I know so often we're so tempted because we're so uncomfortable with race to say it's not a, it's not a race issue. It's a geographical issue. It's an economic reason uh, issue. It is a race issue, and it's not even a political one. It's a human rights issue. Race is a human yeah. rights issue. 
I grew up in every geographical location in the country and I grew up with immense economic privilege and I was still suffered. Yeah. I still suffered problems based on my, based on my race. Would I suffer them tenfold if I grew up um, in, in a geographic location that was segregated to black people? Yes, but have I suffered them still not even close to what other people have suffered despite my, uh, despite my huge economic privilege? Yes. So just kind of steer away from that excuse because that's an excuse that it's really easy to use and I get it on the surface, but um, coming from somebody who debunks it, it just, it doesn't hold up once you really get below the surface on it. No, we, we uh, as, as uncomfortable as it may be to people who have nothing, that they haven't done anything wrong, uh, and nothing racist, but they still have to realize how important it is to, to realize that we are privileged uh, to be born this color in this country uh, and around the world uh, uh, and take a moment to, to, uh, to understand and to be sympathetic to our, to our brothers and sisters, like I say, who are going through this because of their uh, color of their skin. And just because we had a black president, it means uh, what, a, what? 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 It, it gets better. It gets better, but it doesn't mean it's uh, eliminated. Yeah. Um, when is uh, when is the protest tomorrow? So we're protesting tomorrow. Um, I I'll be out there starting at one. I know a lot of other people are going to be out there starting in the afternoon. Um, I'm hoping it's a massive protest for DC. I'm so encouraged to see how many people are coming in from out of town. Um, and I just think any time in the afternoon, you should be able to get a huge mass of people. I don't know which at, what time they're actually looking to start marching, but any time in the afternoon, it's going to matter. Every single body counts. So, well, Daniel, I will be there. Uh, uh, Jay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you for having the conversation.